Thank you very much. It's okay, I'm now, after three and a half years, immune to Brexit jokes. <laughs> it's water off a duck's back. Okay, so I'm going to give you an overview of uh, where we are with gene drives, uh, what are gene drives, which ones are being developed, but I make no excuses for the fact that I'm going to talk about malaria control as a paradigm for this because it's something that I've been working on, um, well, for over 10 years. And so a lot of that work was done while I was at Target Malaria, um, just as a declaration of interest. And then when I've talked about these, hopefully I'm going to touch on some of the issues that arise and what are the challenges in developing these gene drives for an application that might be for mosquito control. So first of all, uh, what is a gene drive? Well, that's just a, a, a labile definition at the moment, but this is my best definition of it. And it's basically any genetic element that's able to bias its own inheritance among offspring. And there are many examples of gene drives that actually exist naturally in nature. So transposable elements, many of you would have probably heard of. These are jumping genes that move around the genomes uh, of most uh, higher order animals. There are certain classes of sex distorters, so these are genetic elements that exist in several different insects and naturally uh, change the sex ratio of populations to bias their own inheritance. And there's another class called homing endonuclease genes, which largely exist uh, in microbes, including yeasts and some other type of fungi. So what gene drives are actually being developed or at least considered for population control? There are some movements to make gene drives for a type of insect pest of fruits, which is called Drosophila suzukii. There are some uh, consortia that are trying to look at the development of gene drives to control populations of invasive rodent species. But by far and away, the most developed forms of gene drives are for the control of mosquito vectors of disease. So before I take this as an example, what do we need in order to consider a species as a target for gene drive as population control? You'll see in a minute that the species that you want to control through a gene drive needs to reproduce sexually. It needs to have short generation times in order to meaningfully change population over a meaningful time frame. And obviously, there needs to be a need. Now, that need needs to be uh, evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and needs to evaluate what are the current alternatives to control of that species before considering whether a gene drive is in any way suitable. So looking at mosquito vectors of disease, the mosquito vectors that we are looking to control are those that transmit malaria. So I know that some of you in the room will know this, but I know that some of you won't. Malaria is a disease that's transmitted only by female mosquitoes. And the reason it's only transmitted by female mosquitoes is because females take a blood meal in order to lay their eggs. And so in the accent, action of taking a blood meal, but they pick up parasites from an infected individual. These parasites develop in the midgut of the mosquito, eventually make their way to the sporozoa, uh, to the salivary glands, where when it takes a subsequent blood meal, the mosquito injects some saliva that also contains parasites, and those parasites establish infection in the human host. And so with this infection of malaria, you get periodic bouts of fever, anemia, and in many cases, death. So still today, there are 200 million cases every year and close to half a million deaths. Most of these, the vast majority, are occurring in sub-Saharan Africa and the vast majority of deaths are in children under five. So I told you it's transmitted only by female mosquitoes, but it's actually only transmitted by female mosquitoes of one particular genus, which is called Anopheles, which contains about 50 or so species. In theory, all of these are potentially capable of transmitting malaria. And if you look at the distribution of all these different Anopheles species, we can see that not only are they limited to sub-Saharan Africa, but they extend across South America, North America, even the northern climes of Europe. Okay? Yet we know that there's no malaria in these areas. All the malaria burden mostly falls on sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason for that is for the predominance of one particular species or species complex called Anopheles gambiae. So despite there being close to 4,000 mosquitoes across the world, there are about 900 in Africa, but all of that malaria burden is targeted through Anopheles gambii and closely related species. And these are responsible for nearly all of that burden. And so what that means is that with a targeted approach, focusing on those species that predominantly 
cause the malaria burden, we can achieve significant gains in malaria control. And these approaches to controlling mosquito numbers can be the use of bed nets, screens to prevent contact, insecticide treatments in spraying indoor residually or on bed nets, and habitat removal. And in fact, I told you that today there are close to 400,000 deaths. Only 15 years ago, there were 1 million deaths. So this reduction in deaths over the last 15 years, if we look to see which interventions led to that reduction in malaria burden, we can see that the majority of that is due to the indoor spraying of insecticides and mostly the use of insecticide-treated mosquito nets. So the message there is that controlling the malaria vector, which is the mosquito, is the best tool that we have for reducing malaria burden. But of course, those interventions have their own problems. It's difficult logistically to ensure the successful uptake of bed nets, their distribution and their perdurance. <coughs> the insecticides that you might want to use either on indoor residual spraying or on the bed nets have a lack of specificity, they can be toxic, and they can select for insecticide resistance. And in fact, if we look at the positive trend in malaria reduction over the last 15 years, has now started to stall, okay? even though that focused largely, largely on the control of Anopheles gambiae. And the reason that it's stalling is due to the emergence of insecticide resistance over the African continent, which is drastically impeding malaria control programs. So we need new insecticides. We should also continue to try and look for new drugs and vaccines, as difficult as they are to control, to, to, to develop. But we also need novel vector control approaches that are going to be complementary with the proven ones. And so that's what's motivated us over the last 15 to 20 years to try and actually understand what it, is it in the genetics of Anopheles gambiae that makes it such a good malaria vector. And so the features that make it such a good malaria are related to its feeding behavior, its intrinsic susceptibility to the parasite, how long it lives, how well it reproduces, and therefore what the population density is like, and where it prefers to live and bite, because that will obviously affect the number of humans that are bitten and therefore subject to transmission. And so with that, we've developed a suite of genetic tools ranging from the original publication of a genome sequence to ways to knock down gene expression or to introduce transgenes into that mosquito. And the overall goal then is this idea of genetic control. Can we discover the genetic basis of those traits that are essential for making the mosquito such a good vector and interfere with them in a population, okay? either by introducing genetic traits that affect reproduction and therefore suppress the population over time, or genetic traits that somehow make the mosquito more resistant to the parasite so that over time the population is modified and is no longer able to transmit the parasites. If you can do that, there are some several advantages. One is that the released insects are doing the hard job of finding the difficult to reach insect niches because they are going mating with the wild type mosquitoes, introducing those traits into the population even if those mosquitoes are difficult to find in the wild. Because it relies on mating, the process is species specific and is non-toxic. So on the surface, it sounds very attractive. But the hard part is not necessarily developing the original mosquito that has some altered genetic trait that makes it resistant to the parasite or susceptible to an insecticide, or somehow has its reproductive ability affected, it's actually getting that mosquito to get that trait into the population. And the reason that's difficult is because no matter how many of these transgenic mosquitoes you can rear in the lab, they will only ever represent a tiny fraction of the wild type population. And so any release frequency that you'll be able to achieve will only represent a tiny fraction of the wild type population and that would not be expected to increase over time. Much more likely is that there would be some negative fitness effect associated with this genetic trait, and it would be lost by selection, or just random causes such as genetic drift that eventually lead to a disappearance of the trait over time, and you don't get your desired effect on the population. So before telling you what gene drive is, we need to understand why this trait doesn't increase in the population. And that's because mosquitoes, just like you and I, have two copies of every chromosome, one they receive from their mother and one they receive from their father. So if you have a genetic trait of interest on one chromosome, but not on the other, there's only a 50% chance 
of having one of these chromosomes in the gametes, so the sperm or egg that that mosquito makes. And from the other mosquito, it will get the wild-type chromosome. And so in the offspring, the frequency of the genetic trait is exactly the same from the parental generation to the offspring generation. So there's no increase in frequency. This is where this concept of the gene drive comes in. So now you have the same genetic makeup, the genetic trait on one chromosome and not on the other chromosome, but instead of having a 50% chance of this chromosome being included amongst the gametes, that now is a much higher percentage because of this gene drive. Okay, so in this case, 90% of all the offspring have it because it was included in 90% of the gametes. And so in this case, every time a mosquito with the gene drive mates with a wild-type mosquito, nearly all the offspring have it in the next generation. And then those offspring themselves, when they go and mate with other wild-type mosquitoes, all their offspring have it, and so on and so on. And so that genetic trait rapidly increases in frequency into the population until it's fixed in the population. And that can happen over a relatively uh, quick time frame in the order of 10 to 20 generations. And one important point is that it can increase that genetic trait's frequency in a population even if that genetic trait has some negative fitness effect on the population. So in terms of a definition then of what is a gene drive for population control, we can modify that previous definition to say any genetic element that is designed to bias its inheritance, but also at the same time spread into the population some desirable trait. So having explained that, it's usually necessary for me to distinguish different types of genetic control. Because all types of genetic control are not gene drive. And so one of the things that you might hear about a lot in the press over the last 10 years is this type of control, which is inundative release. This is uh, a form of the sterile insect technique where you have to mass rear millions and millions of mosquitoes. And then you selectively release into the population only males, and those males have somehow been sterilized. So all of those males that you release are sterile. They go and hunt out the wild-type females locally, and obviously all the offspring are barren. Okay? And so you get a local suppression there as long as you're releasing these mosquitoes. But of course, to replicate that across any geographical area, you need to replicate the investment in infrastructure. And you need to mass rear uh, quantities of mosquitoes that are far in excess of the local mosquito population. And that's the type of technology that's been developed by a company called Oxitec. Gene drive, on the other hand, is an example of an inoculative technique. So you only need to rear a few mosquitoes initially that will take hold in the local population at low frequency, and then over time, the trait increases in frequency and so it's self-sustaining and only requires low numbers in the initial release. So what type of gene drive have we been trying to develop? Well, the gene drive that we've developed is based on one of those examples that I gave you that exist in nature, which are these homing and the nuclease gene. So an endonuclease just means any DNA cutting enzyme has a very specific target sequence. And what these endonuclease genes do in nature is that they find themselves on a chromosome Whenever they come into contact with a homologous chromosome that has their recognition sequence, but not the gene itself, that chromosome gets cut. You get a double-stranded break. And in the process of looking to repair this double-stranded break, it uses the information on the intact chromosome to fill in the gap. And so if it fills in the gap using this as a template, what that means is that the gene is copied from one chromosome across to the other chromosome. So now, when this makes its offspring, instead of there being a 50% chance of inheriting this gene and a 50% chance of inheriting this gene, now all the offspring inherit the gene. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So these exist. The initial idea was to try and tweak these to work in the mosquito genome. But obviously, you have all heard of another type of endonuclease that has a very similar property to this in recognizing very specific target sequences, and that is this CRISPR-Cas9 that Gaetan did a good job of explaining. Okay, so this has two components. The Cas9 protein itself, you consider uh, this like a games console. Okay, on itself, this doesn't give you any game, doesn't give you any fun or any actual power. You have to put a cassette into that, which encodes the game. And in that case, that's the functional equivalent of the guide RNA, whereas the Cas9 is the equivalent of the games console. And so these two together provide the specificity to the system. And so the simple idea was to replace the homing and the nucleus gene that initially existed in nature with simply a Cas9 construct to do exactly the same process and cause biased inheritance of that gene. 
So that's how you get the biased inheritance. How do you actually couple a trait to that? Well, there are two types of trait that you can couple if you can get this process to work in the mosquito. You can either spread with it some genetic modification that increases in frequency in the population but causes a reduction in its reproductive capacity so that you get population suppression. Or with this gene drive, you can couple some cargo or payload that is affecting the ability of the parasite to replicate in the mosquito. And that way you would modify the population so that it's refractory to further transmission. What we've focused on is this type of technology spreading genes that suppress the population. And so we built these without going into the molecular details. I'm happy to answer it later. We built these. We put them in a population of, in the laboratory of wild-type mosquitoes. And despite the fact that they're interfering with reproduction, both of these replicates increase in frequency because of this biased inheritance of the gene drive. Okay, so that was the first time that a synthetic gene drive had been built and shown to spread in the population. Of course, if it were that easy, we'd all be done and we'd have already solved malaria, but there are issues that arise with gene drives. I can't go into all of them, but resistance is one. People are concerned about the ecological and biodiversity effects, how to develop a pathway for their development, and how to get community and regulatory acceptance. In terms of the resistance, okay, as with any technology that looks to suppress a population, they can always tend to select for resistance. And gene drives are no different. The most obvious form of resistance that one might expect is variation at the target site that's recognized by the gene drive in this case. So if you get rare variants that are no longer subject to Cas9 cleavage, you might expect these to be positively selected, and they would increase in frequency over time if they confer fitness to those mosquitoes. And eventually, they would take over the population. So when we ran that experiment for longer, we started to see that the gene drive no longer ex displayed the same invasion dynamics as previously and started to fall away from expectations. And we imagined that this was due to the emergence of resistance. And indeed, it was. And as I said, that's not something that's unique to gene drive. It applies to antibiotics. It applies to insecticides and to some degree vaccines. However, the gains to public health of any of these interventions are not in question. The advantage with gene drive is that the nature of resistance to a large degree is foreseeable, and there are various strategies that we have to reduce its likelihood of emergence. And the most simple one, again, is uh, easiest to explain with analogy to an antibiotic. Any antibiotic that you have that's successful will target a very conserved process in the bacteria that's unique to that bacteria. And with gene drives, it's the same. You want to target a very conserved target sequence that's not easily able to mutate away to a resistant allele. And if you do that, you can spread a gene drive from low frequency to fixation within eight to 10 generations. And as it goes to fixation, you can see it's drastically reducing the egg output such that there's no longer any more eggs and the population crashes. In terms of the, eco how am I doing for time? Am I a bit tight? Uh, yeah, you have like four minutes left, I guess. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> Two minutes. Okay, that's okay. I'm nearly done. Okay, so in terms of the ecological and biodiversity effects, as I mentioned to people in discussions offline, it's all important to put these things into context with insecticides, which are non specific and are taking out all insects wherever you apply them. But what we know about Anopheles gambi particularly is um, that it represents only a small fraction of the inverted biomass for the reason that I told you. There are several more mosquitoes out there. It's strongly associated with humans not known to be a keystone species, not known to be a specialist pollinator, the most probable effect in terms of ecology will result through, if it's successful, the approach, will res result through the reduction in human malaria and a subsequent increase in human populations. But of course, more work is needed on that. And it's important to stress that extinction of Anopheles gambia is not our goal and is not a likely outcome. What's our goal is suppression and elimination of malaria, and you can do that by uh, a drastic suppression of the population without extinction. In terms of how to develop a pathway for the testing of this, there are several different initiatives to try and get consensus on the best way uh, to govern and implement uh, gene drives, including reports by the National Academy of Science and other different national bodies, as well as the WHO and um, documents that the community are working on in order to develop a phased pathway for the testing. And the phased pathway is something that the project that I was working on in Target Malaria has decided to adopt, starting with an initial phase 
that is just releasing sterile GM mosquitoes, so there's no gene flow through to an intermediate where there is some gene flow but not gene drive, before finally testing a gene drive that has the goal of population suppression and potential long-term and sustainable impact on mosquito numbers. Just for your information, in July, Target Malaria did some of the phase one releases in Burkina Faso with GM mosquitoes that are sterile. So that's where the field's at at the moment. In summary, uh, I hope I've shown you that gene drives can be designed to either suppress or modify populations. They are species-specific type of intervention. One thing I want to stress is that the merits and suitability of any gene drive program must be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think I need to mention that to this audience, but some people conflate CRISPR with gene drive, and it's not the case. There are, as you all know, most examples of genome editing using CRISPR are not gene drive. And we're very cognizant of the fact that the implementation of any gene drive requires more than just molecular biology from gene jockeys like me. So a lot of this work was done in collaboration with uh, Austin Burt, so Austin Burt and Andrea Crisanti at Imperial College as part of the Target Malaria Research Consortium, and that was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Open Philanthropy Project. Sorry if I spoke a bit fast. <laughs>